Our next speaker is Dr. Matthias Maivald from Singapore. Dr. Maivald is a senior consultant in microbiology and the head of service at the KK Women's and Children's Hospital and is an adjunct associate professor at the Department of Microbiology and senior consultant in microbiology, National University of Singapore and at Duke National University of Singapore Graduate Medical School. Dr. Maivalt will present on COVID-19 Lessons Learned in Singapore. Thank you very much, Kevin, for the introduction. The topic of this talk is about the COVID-19 situation in Singapore. My name is Matthias Maivalt, as introduced, and I work at KK Women's and Children's Hospital in Singapore. So the background of the Singapore story is that Singapore was hit quite badly by the 2003 SARS outbreak. That's the original SARS outbreak 2003. If you look at the numbers on the left side of the slide, you see that Singapore had 238 cases, 33 deaths, but tragically there were five deaths among healthcare workers, which contributed to the local anxiety. And Singapore learned a painful lesson, basically due to its exposed location as a trade and travel hub, Singapore is extremely vulnerable to imported infection. And since 2003, Singapore kept doing pandemic planning. Here on this slide, you see our hospitals emerging infectious disease pages with the intraweb. And in the intraweb, you have various pandemic precautions listed for 2015. So that was long before the COVID outbreak when MERS, coronavirus, Ebola and influenza A, H7N9 were around. This slide shows you the exercise Sparrowhawk and there were two incarnations. So on each of these occasions, there was a mock patient with a serious infection delivered to the hospital and it involved a role play. It was conducted for Ebola in 2015 with enhanced PPE and respirators, and then subsequently for a respiratory X disease with full PPE with N95 masks, eye protection, gowns and gloves. This slide shows you the Singapore National Center for Infectious Diseases or NCID, which is a purpose-built medical facility which is organized within the public health care system. It has 17 wards, 330 beds and two ICUs, and it has a high level isolation ward capable of handling Ebola, Marburg and anthrax. And it has research and diagnostic facilities such as the National Public Health Laboratory, NPHL, and it was formally opened on the 7th of September 2019, which is unintendedly just in time before the COVID-19 outbreak. So this one here is my workplace. It's called KK Women's and Children's Hospital. It's an 830-bed pediatric and obstetric gynae hospital. It is a tertiary-level academic teaching hospital for the National University of Singapore and uh, Duke NUS, and it is my workplace, and I'm a clinical microbiologist at the hospital's Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine. We have a relatively small microbiology section compared with some of the other bigger hospitals. So in this slide here, you see the early development of PCR assays that became available in January 2020. And there were a few entities that developed them based on the virus sequences. But if you look on the upper right bit of the slide, you see that a PCR protocol was available as early as 13th of January 2020, which was two days after the release of the virus sequence. Subsequently, we adopted the testing in Singapore First, the National Public Health Laboratory implemented the testing. They developed their own PCR system based on the N gene on the OIF1AB gene and published it in JAMA. Other labs, public and private, followed suit, adopted various published PCR assays, and then subsequently commercial assays became available. For example, one from Tibmol Berlin, 
another one, the Fortitude Kit from ASTAR in Singapore, and then another one from a company called Roche, which is a relatively large semi-automated platform called 6800 or 8800. So we at KK Hospital started our PCR testing on 11th of February 2020, and subsequently the whole country or city state, as you call it, had to ramp up their test capacity. So we had to increase it to 500 a day at our hospital, which is a lot for our small lab. Some bigger public labs had 1,500 to 2,500 tests a day. The private labs expanded and Singapore with a population of 6.6 .6 million reached a test capacity recently of about 70,000 PCRs per day in about 27 labs. Serology testing started a little later. KK Hospital started the Abbott N protein assay in May 2020. Some labs now offer the S protein assays, which detect vaccinated and or infected people both. And there is a homegrown test, which is a surrogate neutralization test, which is called the CPAS test for serology. Virus characterization is done by way of positive samples from public hospitals sent to NPHL, the National Public Health Lab, for whole genome sequencing and viral culture. We had to look into the biosafety of testing, so we needed to design particular lab protocols, first of all for the microbiology and molecular microbiology lab, but then also for the other clinical laboratories in the department. And we divided specimen types into respiratory type specimens with a higher risk or non-respiratory type specimens such as blood or urine with a lower risk. And so what you can see here in this picture is a COVID suspect specimen, which is double bagged and specifically labeled and sent to the lab. And so for the higher risk specimens, we are setting up the specimens under safe biosafety cabinets with goggles, N95 masks, gowns and gloves for specimen processing. And we in our lab took the deliberate step of excluding pregnant women and staff on immunosuppressants medication uh, from this type of processing. So here, this slide shows you the early COVID-19 timeline in Singapore. So on the left part of the slide, you see the early timeline until 7th of February. So this consists of the early few cases coming from Wuhan, then the first few local transmissions of cases, and then the first local clusters of cases transmitted. And this prompted the government to raise the disease outbreak alert level, DOSCON, to the level of orange, which is level three. So if you look at the right side of the slide, then you see the timeline until the 2nd of April. So you see again the first few imported cases on the left in blue, then the local clusters and local transmission in orange and red. And then if you look towards the right side of that slide, you see the cases rising up and these are imported cases from travelers, mainly return residents coming back to Singapore. So we had an escalation of the situation Singapore wide. And until late March 2020, Singapore did quite well. The cases were under control with aggressive isolation and contact tracing efforts. The schools and shops were open. The public life was largely unaffected. But then cases emerged at foreign worker dormitories from March 30. And the background to this is that Singapore has about 300,000 low income foreign workers, mostly in the construction sector, for example, from India, Bangladesh and Myanmar. And they are housed in cramped conditions, for example, 15 to 20 people in one bedroom. And so the virus, once it got foothold, it spread like wildfire in these dormitories. And subsequently, once this virus was found out, 
all dormitories were quarantined with the armed forces involved. And you can imagine that the dormitories were literally surrounded by the armed forces and sealed off from the general public. And Singapore engaged in a comprehensive testing and relocation strategy to government's quarantine facilities until the dormitory cases were halted. So here, this slide shows you the subsequent timeline in Singapore. And on the left side of the slide again is the timeline until the 17th of April. And what you see here on the left side is you see three-part epicurve with imported cases on the top, community cases in orange and green in the middle, and dorm residents on the bottom. And again, if you look on the very left side of the slide and see the scale, you see that the y-axis for the dorm residents is much higher. So on the 30th of March, the dorm resident cases started. And on 7th of April, the government reacted very strongly. They installed a circuit breaker, meaning a full lockdown with school closures. Only essential businesses were open. Public mask wearing and social distancing were also implemented. And if you look on the right side of the slide, you see the timeline until the 30th of August. On the upper right part of the slide, you see the overall number of cases, which by August were about 56,000. Then on the bottom of the slide, you see again the three distinct epi curves between imported cases, community cases, and dorm residents. And if you look at the bottom right part with the dorm residents, you see that by about August and September, the dorm cases were largely under control. We in the lab had to cope with increased testing. So there was an increased testing demand from the dorms and government quarantine facilities, and that was distributed across the public and private labs. And it turned out that testing in high prevalence settings is quite challenging. So what we saw was many samples with low level or borderline amplification curves which were apparently in different stages of infection. And so we needed to do extensive retesting with confirmatory assays to confirm the cases. So on the left lower part of the slide, you see a typical amplification run. The red curve is the positive control and everything below and to the right of the positive control are some of the cases that were picked up and you see that some of the curves barely lift off the ground of the amplification plot. And it is a very difficult task in these circumstances to rerun these samples on different PCR assays with different primer systems to confirm them. Subsequently, there was an advent of COVID-19 rapid testing. And so what you see on the left upper part of the slide is a rapid singleplex PCR, which takes about 45 minutes, which is called gene expert. Um, on the right side of the slide, you see a rapid multiplex PCR with about 19 other pathogens, takes also about 45 minutes and gives you a whole spectrum of viruses, as I said. And on the bottom of the slide, which came later into play, antigen rapid tests or ARTs which take about 30 minutes. But the disadvantage of these ARTs is that they have relatively low sensitivity of about 70 to 80% when compared with PCR. This slide here shows you the timeline of the pandemic response measures in Singapore. So if we start from the bottom left of the slide, so February 7th was the implementation of DOSCON Orange. The measures included that non-essential large events were deferred, um, public was reminded of personal hygiene, social gatherings were limited to 10 persons, international travel restrictions and stay home notices for return residents came into place. So this was a fairly mild set of restrictions. Then on April 7th came the lockdown. This was a hard lockdown called Circuit Breaker. So the food and beverage outlets were 
closed, only takeaways were allowed. Non-essential businesses were suspended, schools were closed, and subsequently mask wearing was made mandatory for everyone above the age of two outside the home. And no social home visits were allowed. Then subsequently, starting June the 2nd, there was a reopening phase one, which included a phased reopening of businesses and schools. Then June 19 came the reopening phase two, which included a further loosening of the measures. And starting on December 18, 2020, and going up to early May 2021, was reopening phase three, which basically included a further loosening of measures, but still a gathering limit of eight persons and mandatory mask wearing outside the homes and safe distance measures remaining in place. So this slide here shows you the timeline up to now practically. So what you see on the top of the slide is the pandemic response phases superimposed on the bottom of the slide on top of the case numbers. And again, you see three different epic curves for imported cases, community cases, and dorm residents. Please note different axis scales. So the dorm residents were by far most common. But when you look at September 2020, the dorms were largely under control. So the pandemic in Singapore was driven by the other cases. So if you look then on top of the slide, the green curves, these were the imported cases, but they were mostly detected within quarantine. So they didn't enter the country because they were detected within their 14 days stay home notice. And if you look at the second part of the curve, there was the occasional spillover, but this was rapidly contained. But then starting in May 2021, there was starting to be local transmission in clusters. There was an airport cluster, a hospital cluster, and so on. And so the stay home notice for travelers was increased to 21 days. And routine rostered testing for all healthcare staff was implemented. I'll explain that later. As I said, there was a spike in cases in April and May 2021. Until March, Singapore did relatively well. Life was relatively unaffected. Then the community cases rose. This led to several case clusters, for example, the airport cluster, hospital cluster, shopping mall cluster. And these cases were presumably imported and consisted of return residents and their relatives or were driven by them. The hospital cluster had 48 cases and three deaths. And it was commonly the Delta variant that was mentioned in other contexts here. The Delta variant makes patients presumably infectious for a little longer and presumably escaped the 14-day quarantine. So the 21-day quarantine for high-risk countries was implemented and the measures were to increase to heightened alert on 8th May and taken back to phase two from phase three reopening on 16th May. So after the case spike and hospital cluster, the affected hospital closed for new admissions and there was a deferment of non-urgent cases. And all public hospitals were advised to enhance their PPE regulations, for example, N95 masks, not surgical masks, for all patient fronting areas. All newly admitted patients, regardless of their symptom status, had to be COVID tested. All symptomatic patients in emergency departments were to be antigen rapid tested and PCR tested. And all hospital staff had to be PCR tested with an initial sweep, testing of all staff within two weeks, and a subsequent rostered routine testing of all staff every 14 days for vaccinated people or seven days for non-vaccinated staff. 
And the consequences were a massive ramp up of testing demands. So our hospital has over 6,500 staff. You can imagine what this means for our small lab. And for example, Singapore General Hospital has about 18,000 staff. So we needed to further ramp up the test capacity and implemented a three and one pooling of staff specimens. This was done as a pooling at the lab site. And we received some help and logistic support from other departments for that. Other hospitals, for example, implemented pooling at the point of swabbing, meaning that three staff swabs were stuck into one specimen tube and then sent to the lab. Antigen rapid testing at the time of this talk is not yet fully implemented and the details are still unclear. So at this point in time, I would like to discuss a few of our published research papers with you. So here, this is from early in the pandemic. We had a case of a palsy symptomatic child, a six months old infant admitted for testing in isolation, mainly because the mother was infected and the child was completely asymptomatic except the mild fever of 38.5. The nasopharyngeal swab had a low CT value of 13.7, which corresponds to about 6 billion virus copies per swab. And presumably this child is highly infectious. Our lab's lowest ever recorded CT value for a COVID swab was 9.7. And we calculated this to be roughly about 100 billion virus copies per swab. So the next paper that I would like to briefly mention is a comparison of saliva and nasopharyngeal swab in infected children. And the short of it is that the CT values, the cycle threshold values, which correspond to virus load were much higher in the saliva specimens. And our conclusion at the end was that saliva is not a good specimen for testing for pediatric samples. Next slide, this one shows an interesting disappearance and reappearance of respiratory viruses during the COVID-19 response measures in Singapore. So what we are doing at the hospital is a routine testing of respiratory pathogens by multiplex PCR called BioFire. And around December 2019 and January 2020, we saw a large proportion of positives, which were mainly flu A and B. Then the COVID restrictions set in, DOSCON orange, and then the hard lockdown, followed by the reopening in three phases. And our observations were roughly around April, we noticed that less than one in 10 of PCRs had any pathogens in them. So what was going on had all disappeared. And then subsequently, about 13 weeks after reopening, first enterovirus, rhinovirus, these two are indistinguishable in the assay, reappeared, and later adenovirus. And into 2021, other viruses reappeared, but influenza stayed down. This is our curve. The gray bars indicate the specimen numbers that were collected, and the lines indicate the positive rates of viruses. So you see around December, January, a large spike in flu cases, which is the red line, but then upon implementation of relatively modest measures, the flu cases went down quite dramatically. And then once the hard lockdown appeared, you see the blue dotted lines, which are the enterovirus rhinoviruses, and with them, nearly all other viruses nearly completely disappeared, presumably due to all the lockdown measures and social distancing measures. But then, interestingly, when you look about 13 weeks after lockdown, which is about week 35 on this slide, you see first the enterovirus rhinovirus reappearing, and then subsequently the green line, the adenovirus is reappearing. So what is happening here? And this is quite interesting because the mask wearing remained 
but the social distancing became less in the Singapore population. And we presume that the enterovirus, rhinoviruses and adenoviruses have a certain amount of contact transmission in addition to droplet transmission that can make them reappear at a time of continued mask wear. So this slide again shows you the same things in different colors. So the blue colors here for each virus are the 2019 figures. The red colors for each virus are the 2020 figures. And what you can see is in mid 2020, nearly all viruses are down. And late 2020, enterovirus, rhinovirus and adenovirus came back up, as I said. And the interesting conclusion or partial conclusion from this is, if it is relatively easy uh, for these viruses to disappear, how hardy in transmission must COVID be to be so persistent around the world? So here is Singapore's vaccination program. And in the interest of time, I'll keep it short. Singapore has mainly two vaccines, which is the Pfizer-BioNTech and the Moderna vaccine. And currently Singapore is at 44% of its population having received the first dose and 33% of its population having received both doses and healthcare workers were prioritized, came first in January. The public health measures included contact tracing. And for that, Singapore has introduced smartphone apps uh, or a smartphone app called uh, Trace Together and also a Trace Together token, which is basically a little device that can be carried around in people's pockets. And these devices and apps uh, register when someone comes close to someone else by Bluetooth. And then if someone turns infected, then his or her contacts can be traced. So this is how it looks like in public spaces. So for most shopping centers and public spaces, there is an entry requirement and registration requirement for the purpose of contact tracing. And I will go to the last slide, which is conclusions and outlook. My conclusion is that Singapore generally manages the crisis quite well. It benefited very much from preparedness, as I explained in the first slide. And as of 11th June 2021, there were about 62,000 cases, 34 deaths, which is a remarkably low death rate in international comparison. The outbreak in the foreign workers dormitories led to rapid spread and contributed the majority of Singapore's cases. From July 20 to May 2021, there were relatively few restrictions, but mask wearing and safe distancing and gathering limits remained in place. But then in April, May 2021, there were new case clusters that sparked new temporary restrictions. And on the ground, I would say the work is challenging. There is a large testing demand for our small lab, but we had no major PPE shortages too, because Singapore stockpiled enormously before the pandemic. And we also had temporary lab reagent shortages, which were overcome with centralized procurements and alternatives. So I em emphasize the importance of capacity building and maintaining, which includes the completion of the NCID, our lab was initially under-resourced and understaffed, but improved and received help. And the future is, it is still unclear to me how the pandemic will progress, but many countries now see the cases coming down. And at this point, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and like to return this to the uh, organizers. Thank you again.